We're going back to verse 18 through 25. Last time we looked at verses, uh, we emphasized verses 18 through 20, through 20, up to through, yeah, 2021. And the emphasis was, was on the foolishness of the wisdom of the world. Today I want to focus on that same passage, uh, but how he closed out that passage, and he talks about the foolishness of God, which I thought was interesting. He says in verse 18, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, that is the unbeliever, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, and then he quotes, for it is written, Old Testament, it was, I, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness I will set, uh, of the clever I will set aside. Then he asks these questions that we discussed last week. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And the answer is yes. Then for the wisdom of God, for in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jew a stumbling block to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are being called, i.e. saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God. The foolishness of God is wiser and his weakness is stronger than men. It'd be good for us to remember that in our times of struggle. So we welcome you to uh, Breaking Bread on Wednesday with us. Once again, want to thank those who shared their vittles with us uh, so that we could enjoy the grace of both the lunch and the lesson. Uh, tonight, Today, we're going to uh, look at the, the, the foolishness of God which I found interesting. He talks about the foolishness of the wisdom of the world and then concludes, and he's being absurd, isn't he? He's being absurd. Just in case we, <laughs> just in case we didn't know, know that, he's being absurd. I want to look at four things today about the foolishness of God. God was, uh, Paul was making absurdity uh, to make a point. Uh, normal in Greek debate. Okay, he does that in verses 21 through 25. He says, because the foolishness, the definite article to, to, and the Greek word moros, where we get the English word moron. The, the, the foolishness of God is his omniscience. The omniscience of God is wiser than men. Listen, the foolishness of the omniscience of God is smarter, is wiser than all of the wisdom of the world. All the intellects you could pile together one on, one on top of the other. In other words, what Paul might be saying is something like, the lowest IQ can still be wiser in the foolishness of God because God has the highest IQ of all. I mean, I think sometimes we miss that in studying the Bible. The Bible is the genius of God. And it is the genius of God that every human being 
who has enough IQ, now listen to me, that has enough IQ to be saved can learn the wisdom of God. And is done because the Holy Spirit has been given to him in the church age to teach him all things. It's a marvelous idea that Paul has just given us. The foolishness of the omniscience of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of the omnipotence of God is stronger than men. I just find that an interesting way of Paul stating it. When we continue examining our lesson text, like in verse 21, it says that God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. In other words, the gospel. The world sees the gospel as, a, as foolish. And Paul says, yes, yeah, the foolishness of God to save everyone who will believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He makes that point. He makes it again in Romans, Romans 1.16, when he says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. <clears throat> or, or Ephesians 2.8.9, for by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves is a gift of God. And it's given to every person, no matter what his IQ, if he has enough IQ to believe that Jesus died for his sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and raised from the dead, according to the scripture, that person can be saved. I don't care what his IQ is. And once he gets saved, he's able to tap into the genius of God, the omniscience of God through the word of God. What a powerful idea that is. And the Holy Spirit will teach him all that's necessary for him uh, to cope with the foolishness of the world in his life. Pretty, pretty powerful idea. A pretty powerful idea. When you run across those people that think their child don't have this and don't have that and is lacking this or lacking that, they, this might be uh, an encouraging verse for them. I love it when Paul said in verse 18, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. What a powerful idea that is, isn't it? Number one, every unsaved member of the human race is born physically alive and spiritually perishing, the word that he used in our text. Perishing is one of 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin upon all mankind. Everybody's born that way. Nobody enters this world without entering into a perishing status as an unbeliever. He's perishing. In John 3.16, Jesus used the word perishing, right? Run, that, run, run John 3.16 through your head a moment, right? Didn't he use the word perishing? And you know what the opposite of perishing was in his, in his words? Eternal life, right? It, no longer perishing, but has eternal life, John 3.16. In John 10.28, Jesus used, that, used the idea again. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life. That eternal life is in Jesus. You and Jesus have eternal life, John 5, 11 through 13. And you can never perish. Why? It's been removed through the cross. The message of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ has removed it by the power of God. What a marvelous idea that is. <clears throat> That's what's discussed in our passage of 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. It's brought out again in an in in interesting way in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, a powerful passage. It's used there. Don't let Satan blind your minds to the gospel. Or you'll die perishing. You know what I mean? But if you believe, it'll be removed. And of course, Romans 5, 11, uh, 12 through 21 tell us that it's part of the judicial package of Adam's sin upon the human race. 
Now, if you look, 13 Judicia, alienated from, alienated from God, born blind, spiritually blind, condemned under the curse of the law, at enmity with God, darkness, death, spiritually upon you. You're a natural man, not a spiritual person. You'll never be a spiritual person apart from the gospel of Christ. You're perishing. You're a sinner. Not because you sinned, but because you Adam sinned and you're locked in on it. Jesus said, I came into the world to save the sinner. You're unrighteous and you're ungodly and you're under the wrath of God. Those 13 judicial charges are upon you because you're a human being. And you got it from Adam. Romans 5th chapter 12 through 21. Well worth your read. Here's the second point. Every unsafe person remains under Satan's system of foolish wisdom of the world until he's rescued from Satan's domain and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. You know, the two circles, you put the two circles on your paper at the bottom. Here's the wisdom of the world. It's run by Satan. I gave you all those passages, but one you could write down. I gave you John 12. I gave you John 14, 30, 16, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But the one you ought to write down maybe is 1 John 5, 19. Everybody's born there. In this regard, Paul is talking about the state of perishing. He's perishing. One of 13 judicial charges. He's perishing. Over here is God's system, and we call this, here's what we call this, we call this cosmos diabolicus. Cosmos the world and diabolicus run by the devil. We call it cosmos diabolicus in theology. Over here is God's system. This is called the wisdom of God. This is operated. Over here, this is all human IQ, and this is spiritual IQ. And spiritual IQ trumps it because this, this operates from the omniscience of God and the omnipotence of God and all the other essence of God is how this system works. We call this divine viewpoint. We call it divine viewpoint thinking. Now, how do I get from here over to here? Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Colossians 1.13, the moment I believe the gospel of Christ, I am rescued from there and transferred to there. Colossians 1.13, I, tr I am rescued from the domain of Satan and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. How did I get there? By faith. I believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel saved me by faith, not by works. And there it is. You're not going to get to heaven any other way, but dear heart, you are not going to get any other way. Now you can be religious Till you die and then you discover there are a lot of religious people in hell. You've got to be born again. You got to be born from above, Jesus said. You got to be born again. Colossians 1.13 on your paper, he rescued us from the domain of darkness, Satan, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's in Acts 26.18. It's in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. Uh, 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 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Here it is in Ephesians 5, 8. In Ephesians 5, 8, 8, he says, but you were formerly darkness, hello, but now you are light in the Lord. Over here is darkness, one of the 13 judicial charges, spiritual darkness, and over here is spiritual light. And listen, you not only enter into it, but it enters into you. Ephesians 1.18, through the word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You, because Jesus is light and in him you are light, you enter to him 
and light enters into you. You enter to light and light enters to you. And when light enters to you, it taps into the divine nature of your new birth. You are now children of the light and no longer children of darkness. So stop letting the world tell you because the world's message, you are children of darkness and I'll take care of you. And how does that work? How does that work out? Everybody in here has found out that's a lie. Everybody. Now here's point number three. That's on your back page, I guess. You know what should be on the bottom of your front page? Just guess what ought to be on the bottom that you put. Right there. That should be on the bottom of your paper. I didn't put it. I put it on the board. Do I have to tell you everything? Apparently. Well, you can draw two circles and the, the, and the rest, can't you? Eh? I know. The only thing worse than what's on the board is what's on my paper, right, Al? Al one day said, listen, would you put down, nobody will want your notes but me, would you put down in your will to give me the notes to me? Then he looked at him and said, forget it. <laughs> and I know that because sometimes I, I have difficulty. Now, what did I put down there? Because uh, I write in code, don't we all? We all write in code, I suppose. Uh, point number three. The moment a person believes the gospel of grace salvation, he is born again, watch this now, with a divine nature. I can't tell you how many professors of theology thinks that's, that's a, a mythology type of idea. That that's not really true. You don't really get a divine nature. Kind of like you don't really get born again, you know. That's just a figure of speech that don't mean anything. Truth of the matter is, God says you get a divine. You get born again. You become the 20 status privileges. When you pick up that little pamphlet of 50 things, you read that because this is who you are. It has nothing to do with how you behave. It's who you are in Christ. Those are positional truths. You're a child of God, child of promise. You're an heir. You're a son of God. Yada, yada, yada. Right? And the reason you can be all these things, these 20 status privileges in the 50 things you read, the reason you get it is by grace through your package of salvation. And they are, they are living proof to your mind that you have a divine nature. You have a divine nature. That's why eternal life is given to it. Eternal life. That is the life of God. That's a divine nature in man. Unbelievers do not have it. They are created in the image of God, but they don't have the divine nature of God. The moment they believe in the church age, they get a divine nature of God. Here it is on the top of your paper. I'm going to quote 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Seeing that his divine power, and what would that be called? What would, be, what, what would we call the divine power of God? Omnipotence, seeing that his omnipotence has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, gospel. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers, that's the word fellowship, We usually call it koinonias. Here's koninas. That's fellowship of the divine nature. See the word divine from God? And nature, the nature is how we identify it. Well, that's a tree and that's a bird. You know, that's a fish. That's a wolf. Wait, he's walking upright. Oh, I know what that is. That's a kissing wolf. I just want to see if he's paying attention. <laughs> a divine nature 
partakers of a divine nature, having escaped, and how do you get it? Having escaped the pollution that is in the world by lust. The nature, divine nature, still got no sin nature, but he got a divine nature that, that it operates under the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing to me how many people don't know this. That's why you come to Bible study and I teach you. Divine nature. The divine nature is received by being born again or from above. John 1, 11 through 13. Verse 12 says, as many as received him became sons of God. Or in John, the third chapter, 3, uh, 3, uh, Three through seven, probably, where you you know you've got to be born again, and actually, what he says, you got to be born from above, and because Nicodemus thought it was worldly, and he says no, it's not worldly, and that was that conversation. That's why he said that. No, you got to be born from above, Nicodemus, not from below. Religion can't do it. Religion, Nicodemus, religion can't do it. You're a smart guy in religion, but you're you're dumb as a brick when it comes to spiritual matters. Well, he didn't say it quite that way, but I'm kind of thinking the way he talks to me. <laughs> the first Peter one, one twenty one talks about being born again. He calls it regeneration. By an imperishable seed. That is the person and work of Jesus Christ. And, and, and what, what is the result of that uh, divine nature? The Holy Spirit indwells the whole, our, our, our human body that on the outside is decaying and on the inside is being renewed daily, right? 2 Corinthians 4. Now, that don't mean anything when you're 20. But I can tell you, it means a lot when you hit 80. <laughs> that verse becomes really prevalent when it, Outer really does begin to decay, and, and it's obvious, okay? Now, I want you to put your eyes on, I want, so I want you to go to uh, that 2 Corinthians 4. I want you to put your eyes on this. This is a great passage of Scripture, and, and well worth your read, and, and you need to read the, the greater context of what Paul is saying but I'm time constrained, and so I'm only I'm gonna pull a little bit out, and I'm gonna tease you to go read all of it. But in verse 16, therefore, and I hate be doing this, but I'm gonna start with therefore, which means you should have read everything previously, <laughs> right? So I gotta tell you, there's a part of me that goes, please don't do that. So I gotta tell you that this is only gonna make a lot of sense to you if you go back and read a little bit more. So you at least need to go back to verse 7 because 7 takes us to the context of verse 16, right? If you've got a study Bible, you'll know that. But he, here's what he says. Therefore, therefore do not lose heart. I'll bet you, I will bet you, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not running for any political office here with the word bet. But I would be almost certain because I know you and I know your growth in the Lord that we meet people like this almost every week of our life. Believers who are discouraged I mean really deeply discouraged in their life. Wouldn't you agree with that? Now, whether they'll listen to what, how they got there and what the solution is, is a whole other thing. But we do meet these people, don't we? I mean, just every week of my life, I meet these people. I, I think when you have something to say to these people, God brings them to you, don't you? The, now it's whether or not you'll have the courage to talk to them once they get there and tell them, tell them the truth. 
Therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. But though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man, you know what that is? That's that divine nature. That's that part of man that, that's been born again. That is not, is not his body. It's his soul. When he dies, his body goes to the grave. His soul goes to heaven or hell, and his spirit goes back to the Father, which gave it. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Our inner man is being renewed day by day. Not the outer man. That's a fading. But the outer does not have anything to do with the inner other. And listen, when God sees your decaying body, he sees the temple of God. When you look in a mirror and see your decaying body, would you think that way? Well, you should, shouldn't you? Because listen, the process of aging is just a normal process of life. But who you should see is who God sees. He sees a temple of God that, that is lit up 24 hours, seven days a week. The light's always on. When you look in the mirror, you ought to see the light of Christ in your life and the good life he has given you in Christ. And the confidence you have in this life because of Christ and where you know you will go when that body finally gives up its last breath and you meet Christ face to face. This is what Paul is saying. For momentary light afflictions, that decaying part of our life is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. See, I want you to look in a mirror and see the eternal weight of glory. I want, to see, I want you to see the person that God has produced in you. When I look in the mirror, I think, oh, God, have you done a work in my life? I remember that little kid laying, laying out there in the summer on the front lawn, looking up at the stars and wondering, what, what will my life become? What will happen to me? What will happen to me? What will happen to me? Will my grandparents always be there for me? Why do my grandparents take care of me? Why do my grandparents take on this responsibility? What will happen to me? What will become of me? And I look in the mirror today and I think, oh God, what a marvelous work and what a marvelous journey you have given to me. What a marvelous thing. I see a completely different person. I, I know that must be true for you. I know that. But think about it when you look there. For a moment, light afflictions are producing for us an eternal weight of glory, the glory of Christ, far beyond, but be, far beyond all comparisons. I look at that mirror and I go like, wow, Father. That little five, six-year-old kid laying out of the lawn thinking, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me if my grandparents die? What's going to happen to me? Well, what's going to happen to my life? I don't want to be a farmer, but what am I going to be? I know I didn't want to be a farmer at six. <clears throat> While we look not at the things which are seen, isn't that wonderful? But at the things which are not seen, that's what I'm asking you to do because you have the word of God in your soul. You can do that. The unbeliever can't do that. He has to, he has to look at the, what, what, what it is, and he looks in the mirror, and he goes like, man, I've destroyed the last 25 years of my life. Al, Al and I met a guy today at Chick-fil-A, and Al ministered wonderfully to him. You could tell he was worn and torn by the world, and he looked like an old man. He was just youth. The world does number on him. But if the things which are not seen, for the things which are not seen are, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen eternal. Isn't that wonderful? What an encouraging passage of scripture. I shared that with a good friend of mine who is in the nursing home in Michigan, in Whitehall, Michigan. 
I call him my missionary to Whitehall. And I call him to check on him, see what, how his mission work is going, doing in the retirement home he's in. What a wonderful guy. And this passage has lit his world up. What a wonderful thing. The divine nature is received at, 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 at being born again. <laughs> My goodness. You have all three members of the Godhead. The, the second member of the Godhead living inside our body. That's decaying. Four, the divine nature is able to be renewed. That inner man daily. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Daily. You know, you can do what you want. You look out there and you see these little, these little brown spots on you, on your arms, on your face, in your back. What you going to do with all that? I don't get to cream and cover them up. I know. It's all right. Listen, God bless creating all that good stuff. Truth of the matter is, who do you see inside that's being renewed? Who do you see inside that's being renewed every day, stronger and stronger and stronger, while the outer is weaker and weaker? You're stronger and stronger because the foolishness of God is wiser and the strength of God is stronger. Can you see that in your divine nature? You're not getting older, you're just getting better. How about that? Anybody tell you that lately? Huh? Maybe you ought to tell yourself because God's telling you that. All scripture, all scripture. Well, how does that work? That in, in, how does this renewing daily work? Inhale, exhale of the word of God. That's how it works. How does this renewing work, Ron? Inhale, exhale. Putting off the old man, putting on the new man. Inhale, exhale, putting off the old man, putting on the new. Listen, if inhale, ex, if inhale exhale is really working, you're putting off and putting on. Now, there's some things you can't put off, and that's the natural order of, of decay. But all this foolish, worldly thinking you can put off, right? That's what we're talking about. All Scripture is inspired of God. God breathed, inhaled, exhaled, and is profitable. Watch five fours. What did I say? Five fours. Five fours. Watch this now. Watch this. This is why you inhale and exhale the word of God, and it is profitable, one, for teaching, thank you for coming, for reproof, that's coming after you leave, <laughs> for correction, for training in righteousness, watch this, so that, that's a divine purpose in it, there's a divine purpose in this. The inhale, exhale has, is profitable because God has a plan. So that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for, there's our fifth four, for every good work, divine production in Christian life. You know what that is? Rewards and crowns. Rewards and crowns. Rewards and crowns. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 16. Divine purpose in the plan of God is eternal rewards. Your life is so much more spiritually than what you see. You have no idea how much you're laying up for yourself. You ought to know this, though. You are laying up for yourself. That which is produced in the power of the Holy Spirit by the word of God is laying up for you enormous rewards that will really have meaning to you in the next life. I mean big time meaning. Did you know that? We're adequate. If the word of God, inhale, exhale, is profitable for the normal route of your life, for teaching, for correcting, for reproof, for training in righteousness, but here it is. I mean, that's why you go to Bible class, and that's why you inhale, exhale, but here, here's what it is. Here's the bottom line. Here's the purpose of it. 
so that, watch this purpose, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every divine production in Christian life, which is, listen, which is not just doing it here, but setting up treasures for yourself there. How about that? that wonderful? Yeah, boy. Yeah, it's good to have, it's good to have a little bit, something uh, stored away here. It's good to have a little bit for a rainy day, but you ought to be laying up a whole lot for the sunny day. <laughs> okay. Be no rain up there, be all sun. The truth of the word of God is food that feeds the divine nature of the soul. Think about that. There's no other thing you can feed it with. The word of God, the truth from the word of God is what feeds the soul, the divine nature. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, uh, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, Ephesians 4, 13, John 21, 15 through 19, when he has his discussion with Peter, Peter goes, uh, he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter goes, oh, you know, I love you, man. I mean, love is what the world goes around. I drank a Coke this morning. I know. You know, uh, Peter, I, uh, Peter, if you love me, you feed, feed my lambs. Oh, Peter, you love me? Ah, oh, yeah, it is. Why do you keep asking me that? that? You know. Man, I love you. Feed my sheep. You know, we're the best of friends. So you know. Was that before or after Peter denied him? John 21, is that after or before? It's definitely after. Jesus in a resurrection body, and he's talking to Peter this way. Does he not have a wonderful giving heart? Forgiving heart. Just like we should have. Because we have a divine nature, we are able to learn and live the divine wisdom of God in our everyday life. Isn't that wonderful? Because we have a divine nature, we can, we can possess the genius of God, the Word of God. The genius of God laid out for our everyday life. Colossians 1.28, we proclaim Him, admonish every man, and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Colossians 128. That's why I preach. That's why I teach like crazy. That's why I do it. Because I read Colossians 128 and believe it. We proclaim him, admonish every man. Notice the word every man. Admonish every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete or mature in Christ. That's, that's my modus operandi. Because of the divine nature, every church age believer is, through positive volition to the word of God, is able to participate in the wisdom of God as a child of God. I don't know what your IQ is. Doesn't matter if you got saved because he's going to push your human IQ right out. It's not about human IQ in the Christian life. We don't even think that way. But spiritual IQ, you could have a human IQ out the charts and be, and, and be a moron because you bought into the foolishness of the world. Be a moron in human IQ because you, 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 you have no spiritual IQ in your life. Spiritual IQ is everything. It's the genius of God. So we close with the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay? Let's close. Do what? Too many members of Mensa, which is 140 and above. Okay. I mean, I've known a number of them. They don't even in the milk box. And you can't tell them. Well, you can tell them the gospel because that's the only... 
Well, so we can tell them something, can't we? Well, listen, they know it's foolishness. So we present the gospel so the Holy Spirit can convict them, break up some of that hard, callous ideas in their mind, and bring them to faith, right? Ne I'm, ne I'm never worried about their IQ because if they don't believe in Christ, they're a moron. No, I'm telling you, that's what, that's what Paul... That's what Paul said. I did. That's what Paul said. Foolishness of the world. He called it a moron. He's, he's talking about IQ. Listen, a moron gets saved. Got the, he's got the highest IQ in the world if he gets into spiritual IQ. There'd be no human IQ in heaven. There'd be a lot of it in hell. There'd be none of it in heaven. All right? Well, anyhow, let's, let's have prayer. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our soul, for then it is profitable when it's inhaled and exhaled. It is profitable. It is profitable. And we need to know it, and we need to see it, and we need to visualize it in our life by the word of God that is profitable. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.